Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 286, and we're going to cover Mark chapters 1 through 3. So now that we've covered Matthew, remember, Mark and Luke are very similar to Matthew, except they have different perspectives, and they're arguing different points. Remember, they're looking at a lot of the same scenes and eyewitnesses of a lot of the same events. But Matthew was arguing his case to present his material to a Jewish audience that Jesus was king. Now, Mark is going to argue his case to present that Jesus is a servant. And just for clarity, Luke argues the humanity of Christ and John argues the deity of Christ, that he is God. Now, John takes a different approach. He knows of the gospels there, but he chooses not to use about 90% of their material and he gives us new material in his gospel. So we'll see that there. So a lot of Mark is going to be going over a lot of the same stories, the same parables, but with a different focus. Now, one thing that a lot of people emphasize in Mark is you'll see the word immediately a lot. And it's almost like Mark makes his gospel action packed. And it's rushing toward the cross, rushing toward the suffering servant to argue his case that he has come to be the servant to suffer for our sins. And so see if you can pick up on that, how Matthew gives a lot more detail about some of these miracles. But Mark will say something like, and immediately they were healed. Then he'll move on to another scene. And immediately he was healed. And you will see that over and over again. So we pick up in chapter one, verse one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. And so I hope you see the beauty of knowing your old Testament well, because the apostles lean on it heavily to argue their case for Christ. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord make his path straight. Now, again, Mark is quoting Isaiah 40. So in verse three, prepare the way for the Lord. If you go back and look at that text, that's Yahweh. So Mark also applies the title of Yahweh to Jesus Christ, which even argues for his deity. And I want you to collect all of these verses so you can see how we've come to believe that Jesus is the son of God, the very God, as all of these texts point to that truth. So look at this. The baptism and the testing of Jesus is in chapter one. And Jesus announces the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus calls his disciples and he drives out an impure spirit. And I'm saying all of this to say this is all in chapter one of Mark. But remember, the baptism of Jesus was in chapter three of Matthew. The testing of Jesus was in chapter four of Matthew. Jesus announcing the good news was in chapter four in that Matthew. Then look at this in verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up and the fever left her and she began to wait on them. That's chapter eight of Matthew. So we've gone through eight chapters of Matthew and we're still in the first chapter of Mark. I just want you to see how fast paced and action packed Mark is. The man healed with leprosy in verse 40 happens in Matthew 8. But you may say, why are we reading these gospels over and over? But remember, they're arguing a perspective so they help you see the full view of Christ more clearly. But also some of these gospels give a little more data. Let me give you an example with the man with leprosy. It didn't say this in Matthew, but listen to this in verse 45. Now, Jesus had told him to go present himself to the priest and follow Moses' commandments. But listen to verse 45 to what he actually did. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. And so we get more data that even though this leper was healed, he was disobedient. He was supposed to go show himself to the priest and allow them to go through that thorough examination and declare him clean. Remember, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But we learn in Mark that this guy went into the town and started spreading to everybody what happened. And we know that this was most likely due to his excitement, but his disobedience caused more problems where Jesus had to stay in lonely places. And so we learn that fact from Mark. As we move into chapter two, he heals the paralyzed man. This is only chapter two. That happens in, in Matthew nine. And then if we're looking at Luke, Luke chapter eight. And so just looking forward, Luke is going to give a lot of the healing miracles because Luke is not only a physician, but he's arguing the humanity of Christ 
And so he gives more details around the human aspects of Christ's ministry and those involvements. And we'll see that soon. In chapter 2, verse 13, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. He walked along and saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. So remember in Matthew where we said there were three miracles, then a call? This is one of those calls. And it's happening here in chapter 2, but it happened in Matthew chapter 9. I'm just trying to beat that point of how action-packed this is, even to the point where he's questioning about fasting. That was in chapter 9 as well. And his chapter ends with Jesus saying that he's Lord over the Sabbath. That's chapter 12 of Matthew. So we're almost halfway through the book of Matthew, and we're only in chapter two of Mark. Are you catching what I'm trying to say now? How fast paced this actual gospel is? And so if you were doing a reading strategy, if you wanna get through all of the gospel stories quickly, you will read Mark. But if you want more content, because you have the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes and you can go deeper there and you will wanna read Matthew. And then obviously you get an even bigger picture if you bring John into the mix. And we end here in chapter three today, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. The crowd start to follow him. He appoints the 12 and he's accused by his family and the teachers of the law. It says in verse 20, then Jesus entered the house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said he is out of his mind. So his family thinks he's crazy and listen to the teachers of the law. They came down from Jerusalem and said he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. And this is what Jesus said, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. How can he by Satan drive out Satan? He said, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. And that's when he talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And we covered that in Matthew. So if you have questions about that, refer to our discussion in Matthew, which would be the episode on chapter 12. But he ends here where his mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, your mother and brother are outside looking for you. And he says, who are my mother and my brother? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And so what is he saying there? He's not denigrating our biological families because he'll later teach through the apostle Paul and Timothy that he who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. So Jesus values family. In fact, he looked at John during his crucifixion and told him to care for his mother. And so Jesus places a high priority on family, but he places an even higher priority on spiritual family. What does that mean? Being a citizen of the kingdom is more important than your flesh and blood. Why is it because your flesh and blood cannot save you? This is the problem of the Pharisees. They believe that their bloodline or their privilege or their will and desire could save them. And this is not the case. Just because they were descendants of Abraham did not secure their salvation. You don't need the bloodline of Abraham. You need the belief of Abraham. You don't need to be familiar to Abraham. You need to have the faith of Abraham. And this is what Jesus is arguing here. It's more important to be a part of the spiritual family of God than it is to be a part of any biological family on earth. And you have proof that you are part of God's family based on your obedience, your desire to obey him, is your evidence. Even when trials are getting on you and shaking you to and fro, your faith comes out intact. Now, you may not pass the test perfectly. There may be a lot of bumps and bruises and a lot of mistakes made, but you come out of every trial obeying, desiring to obey, struggling to obey, repenting when you don't obey. And you come out of every trial saying, Jesus is still my Lord. I will not set my faith down and move on to another. I have chosen who I'll serve, and I continue to choose who I will serve no matter what happens, no matter if there's problems in my marriage, no matter if the bank account gets low, no matter if the automobiles start acting up, no matter if there's problems in jobs, if there's conflict amongst believers, if I'm not as encouraged as I used to be, if I'm losing sleep and not able to sleep consecutive hours anymore, if I'm struggling with coldness or boredom, or loneliness, or fear, 
doubt every trial that gets up on my life, it never causes me to put my faith down. Now, sometimes I'm kicking and screaming. Sometimes I'm holding on by a thread. But listen, the line of Judah was holding on by a thread. God puts you in thread-like moments because I'm just going to keep it real with you. God just likes suspense sometimes. He takes it as far as it can go, but he'll never break you. And so just remember, if you've been on this journey and your faith is still intact, Keep lifting your hands up in the air and worship because that's the greatest evidence that you have that you're truly his. Hang on in there, brothers and sisters. It won't be long before we see him face to face. These 80 something years or whatever we get is a mere vapor in light of eternity. Don't look at any plight in your life as too impossible for God. These are momentary light afflictions compared to the eternal weight of glory you will receive no matter what you're going through. Remember, it's gonna get bad, but Christ has not only won, he will continue to war and win on your behalf. Hang in there, brothers and sisters. You guys take care and have a good day.